So what I will tell you today is something that I really wanted to learn. So it was actually, I was going to the books and reading, and then I was kind of understanding, understanding some little things and then put them together. But uh, I'm not um, an expert on the topic. So, so perhaps I have a naive approach and also I don't even, sometimes I don't even use the standard terminology because I don't have it present. Okay, so let me start. Oh, and I also wanted to mention that uh, there are some related works by some other people. So, so I first started to work on this or to study this because I looked at the paper of Marius on Vanes map. Then I looked at the paper of Rui, but I know that there are some people like working on uh, related topics like Christian Ortiz, David Stefani, I wrote it down, Juan Desmoni, uh, uh, Matias de Lojos, I don't know if my lane maybe, the classifying spaces and something like this. Okay, so, um, yes, I don't know, mo motivation. <laughs> um, okay, so, um, what are like the idea of characteristic classes? So, if you have a manifold, then the characteristics characteristic classes is a way to associate to each principal bundle a uh, cohomology, cohomology class. They are global topological invariants and they are studying in, studying top, in uh, algebraic topology, differential geometry, so many different areas. And they serve, for example, to say, when two bundles are different, so if you have two principal bundles over M, if the characteristic classes are different, then they are different. So let me give you an example. Um, these are the churn classes, right? So these are characteristic classes for uh, complex vector bundles. And so there are several approaches to, to characteristic classes. So let me give you two. So one is through the classifying space, which is basically, the idea is that uh, if you fix M, right? And then you study this, uh, so you, you have your vector bundle has rank N and you want to study vector complex vector bundles over M of rank N, then they are classified by a universal um, bundle, right? So the classifying space is the base of this bundle, which is a topological space. And then you have a universal bundle over B. And then all these complex vector bundles are classified by maps up to homotopy from M to B, in the sense that the vector bundle will be the pullback of this universal vector bundle. And the characteristic classes are just the um, the pullback of the generators of the singular cohomology of B. Okay? Um, so, but my point of view concentrates more on this uh, other um, approach, which is using the churn uh, veil theory. The churn veil theory is a way to produce characteristic classes using a connection and so more concretely the curvature of a connection and the um, invariant polynomials of GLN, okay? So I have it written there. So what you, you choose a connection, you look at the curvature, right? This is a tensor going from wedge of uh, 2TM to endomorphisms of E. And then you look at this characteristic polynomial when you plug in, um, the curvature, and then the coefficient will give you the, um, the characteristic, uh, the classes. Okay, so um, another motivation that I had was that, so as, as, as I said, I was reading the paper of Marius of this Vanes map, and then he has a definition for characteristic classes for Lie algebraids, and actually he points out some applications. 
okay? But one of the things that he says is that these characteristic classes, so these are associated to representation of value algebraic. And one of the things that he says is that they actually live in the image of the Vaness map, okay? And this is like uh, in general, so you don't need any connectivity assumptions. So actually the characteristic classes for these um, representations on liquid they come from classes on the, uh, for Lea Gebrow, sorry, come from classes for, uh, from the Lee group point. Okay, and another thing that I was very, like, intriguing was actually the construction of the characteristic classes that he has, because it was kind of, so he had like a major Viatoris argument, luring characteristic classes on open sets, right? And the construction was kind of intriguing for me because what he does is like, okay, you construct it locally, right? So you have your representation NABLA, and then if you fix a frame, then this NABLA alpha, um, the coefficients uh, determine a matrix, right? This omega. And what he does is that he defines the characteristic class um, as the traces, this characteristic class of 2k minus 1, as the traces, uh, the trace of this matrix when you do the wedge 2k minus 1. Okay? This is a local definition. And then he has two, then he has two, um, uh, two options. So he looks at the real case. So when this connection and this vector bundle is real, and then he does a local computation showing that if you change the frame, then this is actually well defined in the sense that the difference is the differential of, a, of, a, of something, right? But if you are in the complex case and you do the same computation, then this is actually not the case. And this, and then Mario says, okay, you replace omega, if you replace omega by omega plus um, conjugate transpose over two, then this works. And I was very intrigued by this computation. I really wanted to, to understand what was going on. Okay, so um, let me give you straight away the definition of, uh, of characteristic classes. So the definition is the following. So you have a Lie algebra over M. You look at the, so I'm, I'm always looking at complex representations. Uh, if it's real, you just complexify. So you, you have this complex uh, representation, which is a vector bundle over M, and um, a way to associate to each R of G, going from X to Y, a linear isomorphism from the fiber of X over X to the fiber over Y, so that all the axioms of, um, of an action uh, hold, okay? Another way to describe an action of a groupoid is, um, it's a Lie group polymorphism from G to GLE. What is GLE? Well, GLE are just linear isomorphisms between the fibers of E, okay? And then, so the, the definition uh, that I have here is the following. So remember that the cohomology that I'm talking about is uh, just the differential cohomology, which means that uh, at the P level, what you are looking is at map, maps from uh, P composable arrows, from the space of P composable arrows to R, okay? So if you look at this map, the right, uh, the right, the right one in the definition, this is just the pullback of this P, the one that, is def that defines the representation, right? So it's even defined at the level of co-chains. And if you look at this, this second one, so let me explain you this ME map. So this actually comes from a Lie groupoid map, 
going from, uh, so this ME goes from GLN, remember the rank of E is, um, is, uh, is N, GLNC, to, oops, to GLE. And what I do is that I choose a base point on M, X0, right? And I trivialize the fiber over X0. So, to X0 in M. And, well, it does what it does, right? So, I take, um, I take a, a, a matrix, and then what I do is that I represent Uh, uh, well, this, this linear isomorphism will be represented by A in the basis that I chose, right? Okay, what is important here is that uh, if I look at the induced uh, map on uh, cohomology, right? So the induced map will be something that goes from, so I do pull back from the differential cohomology of GLE to the differential cohomology of uh, GLN. So this map, actually, I will call it F, it's a Morita equivalence. I don't want to define a Morita equivalence, but the only important thing here is that uh, um, what happened is that the, at the cohomology level, they are, this defines an isomorphism, okay? <clears throat> so M E is just the inverse at the can I ask, can I ask it? Yes. Um in, in both of the cases, uh it's the the differential the differential cohomology of the of this groupoid. In one case it's it's the kind of gauge groupoid of the vector bundle, in the other case it's the general linear group. Yeah, uh Sorry, uh, wait, so this is the differentiable cohomology of groupoids, right? So in this, in the right-hand side, the differentiable cohomology of the groupoid G, in the middle is the differentiable cohomology of the group of GLE, right? And in the left-hand side is the differentiable cohomology of the groupoid or the Lie group GLN. Okay, so is that is that the same thing as the, as the ordinary real cohomology of this kind of BGLNC, this kind of geometric realization of the group? BGLNC, differentiable cohomology of B, no. Uh, like, the, like if you take the if you take the classifying space of GLN and look at the, just the real cohomology of that, is that no, equivalent no, to the not, differentiable? It's not, but it, it is related. I will explain a little bit afterwards. Okay, um, uh, Okay. so let me give you like some local formulas or try. <laughs> right. Okay. Well, one, one quick question. Uh, this, uh, is it important that you uh, do complex uh, vector bundles? Uh, yes, because if you remember uh, in the motivation, I told you about these local formulas that Marius has in his paper. And actually, the, when he finds problems when he goes to, the, to, to do this gluing of this major Viatoris uh, argument, the problem that he has in, is that when he goes to the complex case, okay, to glue, that they glue properly. So there is where you find a problem. When it's real, you don't have a problem. So when you start with that real uh, representation, what you can do is you complexify it, and then you have the characteristic classes. But I mean, uh, this, this map uh, ME uh, is not no, 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 it's isomorphism not if it's real. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So no. the, the cohomology, it's always uh, with real coefficients, OK? Maria, no, I'm asking uh, if, if the vector bundles are real, is this map ME still an isomorphism? If you take G and yes. R? Mm -hmm. Yes, yes. It doesn't matter. The connectivity is not a problem. 
Okay. Sorry, so, uh, I want to ask, uh, for instance, in the real case, uh, the cohomology, the differential cohomology uh, vanishes over degree uh, zero because mm -hmm. uh, the cohomology of GLN uh, is the same as the orthogonal group and is compact. And in the complex case, the I don't see it right now, but I have the feeling that it also vanishes, that this cohomology, differential cohomology of GLNC in C is a uh, concentrated on, on, on the D0. So the, the cohomology of GLNC, no, is not uh, no. no. You have meaningful things uh, on, on every degree. Yes. This is actually uh, so I will explain. I, I actually so you will get to see everything because I will compute the cohomologies. Okay, I will compute the cohomology of GLNC and I will do it uh, at the co chain level. Everything okay, but okay, but I, I, I have done this computation recently. Actually, it is done, for instance, in, in the uh, in the thesis of uh, Camilo Arias Abad, okay, when of they see sí, the differentiable cohomology of the LNC, you mean? Yeah, I think so. And they compute the spectral sequence associated to the Bot Schulman, which is the other cohomology, you know, which is meaningful, which agrees with the Gaussian space. And uh, if I remember correctly, on, on each line, on each uh, horizontal line, uh, uh, when they compute the horizontal cohomology, already collapses the, the, the complex and it's a convergence after one step. We can talk, I, I don't know much about the, these spectral sequence arguments, but I have a very com concrete computation. You can also look at some uh, books where they, where they, so you, Actually, I will apply a Van Est theorem, one that we have with Eckhart, and this is just the the Chevalier. <laughs> Sorry, okay. this is just the Chevalier um, uh, relative. Wait, this is the cohomology of the Lie algebra GLN relative to UN, which is not trivial. Okay, so let me let me continue and then uh, well we can we can afterwards we can see what happens with these spectral sequence arguments. Okay, so locally what you are doing so if you have a vector bundle which is just m times c n, actually you have and there you have a map from G L E to G L N, which is well. If you have a linear isomorphism from EX to EY, of course this EX and this EY are CN, right? So this linear isomorphism is given by a matrix. Then you associate the matrix, okay? And what it happened is that, well, if you compose with the F that was going from GLN to GLE, which, which was given in general, this is the identity. So at the coaching level, uh, this uh, ME is represented by the pullback of this R, okay? And um, so uh, what I really, so I really want to have all the description very, very concrete. So I really want to describe this, um, the cohomology of GLN at the coaching level, okay? So what I will do is that I will, use this Van S integration map that, um, that we work it out with a card that goes from the chevalet Eilenberg cohomology of the Lie algebra relative to the maximal compact subgroup of GLN, which is UN, okay, uh, UN. Okay, so um, what I wanted to, to say here is that uh, this part, this, this part, this has some very nice linear algebra and 
uh, it's I don't know. You can also see a little bit what the, what the relation. What is the relation with the cohomology of the classifying space of of GLN? Okay. So uh, what did I do? I don't know. Okay. So what I want to what I want to try to say is that uh, so first I want to 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 explain a little bit how you compute the cohomology of the classifying space of a D group and then I want to show you like a Vanest integration map that goes uh, from the infinitesimal let's say model of this cohomology to the global model of the classifying space. And in the second part, I really want to do the computation for the cohomology of GLN, okay? And there I will use uh, the polar decomposition of matrices. And then you will really see the formulas, local formulas for uh, characteristic classes. Okay, so, um, uh, okay. Okay, so just to have in mind, I, I, I really, I mean, I, I'm not, cons like, this is not really the, well, I will not talk about this classifying, classifying spaces much, but I just want to, you to have in mind, again, why uh, they are important. So again, if you have, um, so if you fix M, all these principal G bundles, G is a group over M, I classified by this classifying space, BG, in the sense that uh, they are classifying by functions going from M to BG, in the sense that they are all pullbacks of maps uh, of these functions, right? They are pullbacks of this universal classifying uh, principal bundle. So over BG, I have a universal G bundle, principal bundle, and um, the characteristic classes of P will be just the pullback of the generators of the singular cohomology of BG. This is a topological uh, uh, space, okay? So how do I compute this cohomology? So as it happens with manifolds that, um, I can compute the cohomology of a manifold using the, the RAM complex, right? Here, the cohomology, the singular cohomology of a, of a manifold, I can compute it using the, the RAM complex. Here, I can compute the singular cohomology of BG using something called the bolt schumann complex. Sometimes, they said, well, Schumann, Staffel or something. I, I, Staffel, Staffel, Staffel. <laughs> okay, so let's, let me explain you this, this complex. So I, actually, first of all, I will explain the complex for EG, okay? Why? Because the complex for BG will be a subcomplex. So this EG is a simplicial space. So at the uh, P level for P uh, uh, natural number is just G to the power P plus one, right? So it's P plus one copies of G. And then you see that, okay, so you have a simplicial structure. So you have several maps um, lower in the degree of P, which what they do is, Either they forget the first arrow or the last one, or they multiply two consecutive arrows. So if I do a pullback of these maps, right, and I take the sum, this, what we'll do is, uh, if I look at forms, they will go for, from forms of EP to forms, of, to forms of EP plus one, right? So this is the horizontal differential. And the vertical differential will be just the RAM differential, okay? Um, now, um, this complex, it has more structure. 
uh, how? Well, these EPG, they are actually G principal bundles over BPG. BPG is just G times uh, uh, GP times, okay? You can act uh, on the last component, right? So these, they are just uh, G principal bundles. And well, if you look at the infinitesimal action, then, well, you have contractions and you have the derivatives. And just in the case of principal bundles, if you look at forms of the total space P in my principal bundle, which, uh, which uh, so that when you contract with the infinitesimal uh, generators or you take the lead derivative and they are zero, this means that they come from the base, okay? So <clears throat> my base here was the PG, right? So, <clears throat> What I wanted to say is that the, the complex that computes the um, cohomology of BG will be this basic complex, this one that I have on the left uh, corner, which is just the kernel of contraction uh, with the kernel of this Lie derivative. Okay? And then the cohomology, well, as I say, the cohomology of BG will be the cohomology of this subcomplex. Okay, so um, eight, nine. Okay, now let me let me go to the Chernval theory. The Chernval theory is somehow um, the infinites infinitesimal. Well, the the Chernval theory allows you to compute this uh, cohomology of BG in terms of polynomials of the Lie algebra, okay? So... Maria Melia, sorry yeah. to interrupt, but I think it's a good moment since uh, now you're going to change a bit the subject. I uh, double, choke, double check what I said, and the point is the following. I, I understand you're right that the cohomology, uh, uh, the, the point is a general linear group, uh, the complex general linear group, uh, is not compact. Okay, but here is a, the, the, the issue. Yes, I understand your confusion. You know, like, I, I understand because I also sometimes think like this, and then I'm confused for a minute, and then I realize what is my confusion. So GLN yeah. contracts to UN, right? So the cohomology exactly. of the spaces, they are the same. But actually, yeah. if you look at the differential cohomology, they are different of the Li, of the Li groups. It, it is true, but let me... Uh, point the, the following fact that is still uh, uh, bothering me a bit. Uh, you can take for a complex vector bundle uh, the uh, red, uh, uh, take a metric no and, and do re reduce a group the structure group to the to un you know? mm -hmm. and then uh, this map classified map that uh, you were uh, modeling with the groupoids will factor through uh, UN. And then the, the differential cohomology, this map, uh, should factor uh, through this. Okay, uh, so, so let, me, let me continue because I think I have some stuff related to what you are saying that you will see. Okay. And then okay. maybe we can really look at these things because I think I've been thinking also about that. So it's good that. Okay. So, but, but now, uh, thanks, and, and I, I see the conclusion was essentially this, uh, thanks. Okay, okay, so uh, let's see. So this uh, veil algebra is like the infinitesimal version of this. I mean, I can think of like the veil algebra as the infinitesimal, infinitesimal version of this Boltzmann complex. Uh, so this veil algebra is just, so you take the symmetric, uh, symmetric uh, maps of G star, and then you have this part of these anti-symmetric uh, maps, okay? Then you have, this is a, um, uh, a complex, so it, it, it is a double complex. So on the part of the anti-symmetric part is like the Chevalet Eilenberg uh, differential with values in this S of G star, which is I mean, this, this is a representation induced by the quadjoint representation. And 
well, you have another differential. I don't want to <laughs> tell you about this other differential. It's very easy, but okay, it doesn't matter. So, but this, this algebra has more structure. It also has contractions and also has three derivatives. The contraction, so in the anti-symmetric part, it acts as a contraction. And in the uh, symmetric part, it's trivial, okay? And then you have also the derivatives, which are just given by the quadjoint uh, action. Okay, so, but look, look something. So when, when you have, remember that I had this complex of the Bottschumann complex, right? Which were given, were, were forms on the, these spaces E of G, right? So when I have, when my Lie algebra is the Lie algebra of a Lie group G, I can use the left invariant Mauder Cartan form to have a map from G star to one forms on G, right? So these are identity, so this Mauder Cartan form basically identifies uh, maps on G with left invariant uh, forms on the Lie group, okay? But look that actually this omega one of G is omega one of E zero G, right? And this gives me a connection in the sense that, okay, so I have this, uh, this, this map, which also is equivalent with respect to these contractions and these lead derivatives, okay? And, um, um, okay, so, what happened is that, so Alexeyev and Eckhart, they, what they, they have a theorem saying that, okay, when you have a connection like this, this actually in the right-hand side, this, this Bolchumal complex is an, it's, it also has a product, but it's non-commutative. So when you have something like this, you can extend, extend, extend this map, this connection to, um, map from the Bale algebra to the Bottschumann, Bottschumann complex, okay? And this map, it's, uh, well, it respects these actions, okay, and the differentials. Now, if you look at the basic subcomplex, so the basic subcomplex is, well, in this side, in this side, it was the kernel of E x intersected kernel of L x in this other side was the same, right? But for the other complex, remember that contractions they act on the symmetry on the anti-symmetric part as contractions, but on the um, symmetric part they are trivial. So look that the only thing that survive are this symmetric part, the polynomials, right? And well, invariant means that they are invariant with respect to this uh, adjoint action, okay? So uh, in particular, if you, if you look um, at this map restricted to the basic subcomplex, this is um, an algebra map in cohomology, okay? And well, I wanted to, before I pass to the next slide, I just want to point out that if you compute the differential on these invariant polynomials, it's zero. So it's cohomology, it's itself, okay? So in this um, next slide, it says that when G is compact, right? Actually this map is a, a homotopy equivalence, okay? What it means is that the cohomology of BG is actually uh, the ring of invariant polynomials of G star, okay? So that's how you compute it, the, the cohomology of the classifying space. Now, when G is not connected, you, I mean, you, you, can, you can also, you also have something similar. So actually what you do is that you take this, um, this map, right? But now you don't restrict it to the basic subcomplex. You only restrict it to the K basic subcomplex. What it means is that I'm not, 
taking the intersection of all EX and LX, just of EX and LX, so, so that X belongs to the least sub, uh, subalgebra K. Okay, uh, sorry, I forgot, I, I guess I forgot to say, well, in the general case, G is connected, you take the maximal compact subgroup, okay, and then you are looking at the relative, at the complex relative to this, uh, to the Lie algebra of the maximal compact subgroup, okay? So here, the K basic part means that I'm taking intersection of the kernel of contraction and Lie derivative, but for elements in K. Okay, and what happened is that, um, well, I have this map, this one here, and this is actually very explicit. I will explain in a bit. And, I'm sorry, uh, Maria, Amelia, may I ask one question about your theorem? Sure. Is, is the Lie group G, is it completely arbitrary, connected? Uh, yeah. Is it not assumed to be reductive or, sem or semi-simple oh. or anything? No, no. Could be null potent, for example, and in that case, the maximal compact subgroup will be, say, trivial. No, it's in general. Completely general. Okay, thank you. Okay, but I guess, well, you you have several arguments saying that okay, G, if G is compact, uh, if K is compact, then you can, um, you can, if maximal compact, then you can contract G. I mean. You can see this, there are some versions of this theorem going from like having other maps that may be, maybe may, these other maps may be more well known. This one here is a bit, uh, a bit, a bit new, I guess. <laughs> but, um, so let me, let me give you, let me explain here what I do. Okay, so, um, so here what happens is that um, when I take this quotient of G and uh, G mod K, this is actually isomorphic to a vector space, Rn, right? So this is contractible, okay? Now, what happened here is that remember that, um, let's see, so, so remember that this was uh, something like this. BPG times G, right? This is G, so EP is G to a power P plus one, right? So I can just decompose it like this. Remember that G is acting on the last component. So if I look at K basic things, it's actually, this is actually isomorphic to um, things, uh, to forms in BPG times G mod K, okay? But here, well, G mod K is a contractible space. So I have a the RAM type homotopy operator right, which is like integration, integration on this last component. So I can lower the degree. And, um, and then what happened is that, okay, so I have this, um, so the projection from, from, from this space to BP induces a map from these complexes, uh, an, an inclusion, okay. From, sorry, not here, the projection to, uh, I, so the projection going from this space to BPG induces this map, right? And then, uh, well, this is an inclusion of double complexes. And then the inclusion from BP to BP times G times G mod K induces this other map, which is actually, I mean, it's not, it's not that it's a, 
uh, is a map of double complexes, but what I have is that the commutator of this operator with the RAM operator is the identity minus these two compositions. Okay? So, so let, me, let me give you something very general when I have something like this. So you see like T is like a homotopy operator for one of the, of the differentials that I have in these double complexes, right? So when I have an homotopy operator for one of the differentials, what I can do is that I can perturb a little bit the, 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 this, this T and I can also perturb a little bit this uh, I star, right? And what I do is that when I apply this perturbation lemma, and then I perturb this, this one to produce this one here. And it's actually, there is a formula. So there is a formula for this perturbation. And the perturbation lemma is telling me that this I star bar is a homotopy equivalence with inverse uh, P star. Okay? So basically this is the, this is, this is the, the, the proof. I know that I was very uh, vague a little bit, but I mean the idea is clear. And the formula for this, uh, for this I comes from, from this T, from the contraction. Yes? Why do you need to perturb? Like, uh what like your dif because what is the information i have i i have two complexes right and these are double complexes so this t is a homotopy for one of the differentials not for both oh okay yeah right so when i perturb i i create a new operator which is a perturbation of t which now is a, a homotopy for both right for for the total differential okay i think i'm a bit slow but <laughs> okay um and some other thing which was very nice was that um uh, if you look at this compose composition and then remember this that these complexes so this veil of G, right, this has a symmetric part of G star and the antisymmetric part of G star. If you restrict only to the antisymmetric part, so you go to the Chevalier Eilenberg complex of G star, what happened is that, and you restrict this map, a nice thing is that you recover the map that, uh, that we have with Eckhart which is also a homotopy equivalence going from the chevalet eilenberg complex of G star relative to the maximal compact subgroup to the differentiable cohomology of the Lie group, okay? So, so the restriction is actually we recovered the, the map with a card and um, so let me tell you a little bit how you compute this map, this, this, this Van Est integration. I want to tell you because I will use it. So what I do is that remember, so this, this thing here, right? So remember that I can, so in general, I can identify sections of wedge of G star with left invariant forms on G, right? Now, when I look at this K basic subcomplex, remember that this K is the maximal compact subgroup, what I recover is the is, uh, forms, but now on the quotient, which are also left invariant, okay? So this, goes to something like this. Okay, now what I have is that, um, well, let's, 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 let's explain this map for, 
one forms, okay? So I want to produce, so if I take a section of G star, I want to produce, uh, a, 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 sorry, I want to produce a map from G to R, right? And what I do is the following. So um, this one here applied to an element G is just what? Well, let me explain here what I do. So G mod K is diffeomorphic to this quotient, okay? Which is a vector space. And then here the, the, the zero will be K, right? So this is, this is, this goes, E goes to C or K goes to zero. So what I can do is to use the, the multiplication on this space by T to produce, to produce, so here I have E of K, E of K, and then I can go to G by multiplying by T, right? So here is T times G of K. So actually what I have is a map from the in interval to this curve, right? Which is multiplying uh, the, the class of G by T, okay? So what I can do now is to pull back this form alpha, right? So here I'm in G mod K. So I pull back this form along this path. This is a one form and then I integrate. Okay, sorry, this is a little a bit messy, but I think the idea is clear. Okay. Can you, I don't know, I didn't quite catch, what is the, what is this EK and what is the, the thing on the bottom of the screen? On the bottom, what? Like this uh, TGK going TGK. between. No, it's just I'm just saying G mod K, it has, you can multiply by T because it's isomorphic to a vector space, right? So I'm just multiplying the class of G, right? I'm considering this curve, which goes from, from, uh, from, from the class of K to the class of G, from the class of E to the class of G, which is just multiplication by T. Oh, it's like it's supposed to be a straight line yes. from the identity to K or to G. Okay. Uh, so let me, I think, <laughs> well, now I will go kind of fast to, to this uh, uh, second part. So, so in the second part, I will actually use this one as map, right, to describe the cohomology of GLN very explicitly. And uh, well, in this case, so I will use the one as map in the case where G is GLN, GLN C, which is connected. My maximal compact subgroup then will be the unitary group, right? The, well, the Lie algebra is the anti Hermitian matrices. So, what I want to do is first of all, I need to describe explicitly the relative. Uh, complex of GLN, right? And then I really also, I, I need to describe this, this um, not linear, this multiplication by T, right? On the quotient GLN mod UN, right? To, to have these paths. I mean, to be able to multiply and then pull back, for, pull back forms. Okay, so I have two, two things to describe this, this, this part, and then to explain how to do this. Okay, and for, so I will concentrate first, first on this part, and to do that, I will use the polar decomposition. So the polar decomposition, it's a decomposition of matrices on, uh, I can decompose it, decompose any matrix, 
as a part which is anti-Hermitian anti and the other part which is Hermitian, right? And this is the composition. This here that I wrote is the, the composition that I use, okay? But look at this, comp the composition. So I wrote GLN as UM plus P. This is a composition. It then enjoys many properties like, uh, like the Cartan decomposition, only that this GLN is not semi-simple, but it has these properties. So this composition has, well, the first thing is that UN is a, a least algebra, right? The second thing is that when you do the bracket of uh, an element of UN and an element of P, this is again an element of P. And then if I do the bracket of two things that belong to P, then they are uh, in UN, okay? Now, there is a little lemma uh, saying that if you have a Lie algebra that decomposes as K plus P with K a least algebra, right? So K here plays the role of UN. Then if B is satisfied, then the K basic um, uh, part of uh, of wedge of G star, right? Remember, K basic means that uh, is the intersection of um, uh, of of things that when you contract with an element of K is zero, and if you do the coadjoint with the an element of K, it's also zero. Okay, but what it happens is that. Um, if B is satisfied, then just restriction identify these two, uh, these two vector spaces. Here are just anti-symmetric maps on P star, which are invariant via the coadjoint action when you plug in elements on K, okay? Okay. And now, if moreover you have C, then you can under this um, under this identification, which is very natural, you can see what happened with the differential on the right here, right? And actually, if C is satisfied, this differential is zero, the one that corresponds to the Chaval Lake Eilenberg. Okay? So actually the cohomology is computed as anti-symmetric maps on P, which are K invariant, okay? And well, so you already have the, somehow the co-chains at the level of co-chains. Okay. Um, uh, okay, so let me, let me go to the, um, to follow the description. And then, so what happened here is the following. So you can look at the characteristic coefficients of the characteristic polynomial, right? The characteristic polynomial is this one here of the determinant. And these characteristic coefficients are um, polynomials on A. They are, so I described them here, they are the trace of doing the wedge of A k times. Okay. And, well, there is something that tells you, well, there is a theorem or whatever that tells you that the invariant uh, homogeneous polynomials of GLN are generated by these characteristic coefficients, okay? And then there is a general theory saying the following. This actually happens for any uh, Lie algebra. So, here I'm considering only GLM, but this happens for any Lie algebra. If you look at the space of invariant polynomials, homogeneous invariant polynomials of G, then you have like an anti-symmetrization map that goes to um, anti-symmetric maps on the Lie algebra. And actually this map sends a polynomial to a closed, an invariant polynomial, <laughs> to a closed um, invariant uh, anti-symmetric map, okay? 
And here is the formula. It's an anti-symmetrization formula in this case. But this map, it has many properties. Actually, uh, well, I, I, I'm not using them, but for example, uh, when, when the Lie algebra is reductive, then the image of the generators of the homogeneous polynomials invariant, the image are generators for the Chevalier-Eilenberg uh, Eilenberg cohomology of G, okay? For reductive Lie algebras. Actually, GLN is reductive also. But okay, so, um, so what happened here is that, okay, at least now I have some candidates for the, uh, for the, for the, um, to compute the, the, the Lie algebra cohomology, the, the reductive, uh, the reductive, not the uh, relative Lie algebra cohomology. Okay, so what happened is the following, is that if you look, remember that I'm identifying the cohomology with these, with these maps, okay? And remember that these phase are already invariant with respect to the quad joint. So they are already UN invariant, right? So if I restrict to P, they are already UN invariant. And you can see, I mean, you can do a easy computation and then you can see that if you restrict to the Hermitian part to P, then if Q is even, then they are, they are actually um, purely imaginary, right? And if they, if they are odd, and then you restrict to P, they are purely real, right? So you multiply by this I to produce an anti-symmetric part, an anti-symmetric map that goes from a GLN star, wedge or whatever, to R, okay? Remember that here I'm computing a, a cohomology with real coefficients. So actually, um, well, these are the generators for this, uh, for this degree. And then the cohomology is actually the wedge of these uh, generators. Okay, you, you see that it's already, it only has a, a degree. Okay. <clears throat> um, actually, there is also another theorem. Let me, um, no, let, let me not mention that. But, okay, so I already, I'm out with late, right? But I think I have. Yeah, I, yeah, I mean, know. I think you can keep going a bit because there were like a lot of questions and discussions, so. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. <laughs> okay, so now I have explicitly the description of, of the Lie algebra, right, of this part at the coaching level. And actually, well, uh, by, for example, the theorem that we have with Eckhart, we know that this uh, Vanessa integration map, it's a homotopy equivalent, so we already know that the cohomology of GLN is the wedge of uh, the image of the generators, right, of this one. Okay, so, but now let me, so I actually want to compute them, right, at the coaching level. So let me, so I, I have to go back to the, to the definition of this Vanessa integration map, and I also need to give you the linear structure that the quotient of G mod the maximal compact subgroup the linear structure, I, I want to give you the linear structure precisely, right? So for that, I will use the, oh, again, the polar decomposition, but now at the Lie group level. Okay, remember that at the Lie algebra level, this was like P plus UN. What you can see is that the at Lie group, at, at the Lie group level, you can write GLN as the product of P, where P is just the image via the exponential map 
of Hermitian matrices and UN. Okay, so this decomposition because it enjoys all the properties, trans all these properties that I told you before, um, translate to this decomposition. In practice, what what you see is that any uh, invertible matrix can be uh, decomposed or, or can be written um, uh, by like e to the power x, where x is a Hermitian matrix, times an element of un. And this decomposition is it's unique if GLN, if, if the matrix A is invertible, for example. Okay, so from here you can already see that the quotient of GLN with UN can be naturally identified with P. At P, the one that is inside of the Lee, Lee group, or P, the Hermitian matrices, right? And the identification, well, is very natural. <laughs> For instance, if you take a Hermitian matrix X, well, you can identify it if you look at uh, look at it at P, then this is E of X. Or if you look at the quotient, well, this is just E of X, uh, UN, right? And of course here, we already know what is the linear structure. is the one that comes from the exponential map. So T times E, actually I, I, I don't, I want to consider them more like in P, okay? So T times E of X will be just E of TX. Okay. And, uh, okay, let me compute one, but I think, I mean, the computations, if you go to higher degrees, they are more complicated, but I think you can do them, like using the Baker, Campbell, Hausdorff formula or, so, or properties, properties of these decompositions. Okay, so let me compute the, the first one. So the first one, remember that is the, the image of the, of the integration map of V1. Now, V1 is just the trace restricted to, I oh, know, sorry, V1, no, uh, this was one, the U1, U1 was just the trace restricted to the Hermitian part, right? This is a map from GLN to R, the Lie algebra. Okay, remember what, what I do to compute this integration map is to identify, um, this is, it has a star, to identify the, um, the relative, uh, well, to identify, in, for instance, in this case, to identify uh, maps from P to R UN invariant with one form, some P, which is the global counterpart, GLN invariant, okay? So I make this identification, which is very natural. And then, well, I need to, so this V1, this is a map from GLN to R, right? This is a, a one co-chain, so it's just a map. V1 is just a map from GLN to R. So I, I want to see what happens when I plug in A, a matrix, right? So what I do is I write A as um, EX times U, the, I use the polar decomposition, right? And then I look at this path right, this path on P, or if you wish on the quotient GLN mod UN, which is canonically identified with P. This path that goes from, let's say, the, the unit to A, right, to the, not to A, I mean to the, to the class of A, right, and this path is just this one, so it goes from, uh, well, it, it takes T and it goes to E times TX, exponential times TX. Right, and then you can do the, comp the the computation, which is very, is very, I mean, it's very simple and, and cute. I mean, you do this v1 of e x of u. This is just the um, integration of the pullback of this um, 
of here I'm looking at this uh, trace as a one form, and then you evaluate a DDT, right? So what happened, gamma A sends DDT to this one, right? You have to differentiate, right? Now you use, um, so this is, so this one here is gamma of A of DDT, right? And then what you do here is that, okay, now the, the form trace P is left invariant, right? So I can apply this left uh, multiplication. Well, and then you compute it, and then it's just, just the trace of X, just the trace of the Hermitian part, okay? Uh, so let me go back a little bit. This one will be fast, I promise. So now that I have all these local formulas, I can actually compute the first, the first characteristic class of a representation of a groupoid, right? So I use this, um, all these uh, documents. Maria, Maria Amelia, can I ask yes? a question? Sure. So can't you show directly that this U1 that you had, that the code chain is gonna vanish if and only if the representation has a invariant volume form? Yes, I think you can because, and actually, I guess it's kind of the same, well, some of you, the proof that you have, you can, you know that if you have, um, you can compute V1 B, B of E and V1 of E star, right? Of the, of the dual. Mm -hmm. And then, and then if you have this Hermit, Hermitian uh, metric, which is compatible with the action, you can, well, you have that they are the same because you okay. identify one with can't you take, can't you take like the top power of E, the top wedge power of E, which is a representation, and then relate the V1 for that with this V1? Maybe, I haven't thought about it, but maybe. I mean, I think there are several proofs. Okay. Maybe here already you can see, right? Because I mean, if, if if the representation, if you have a Hermitian mat uh, matrix, uh, actually the, this, this, this one here, right? I, I think you are telling me about this part. If you represent, I mean, if you have, if you have these matrices, which are giving you the representation locally, right? I'm talking locally. Well, you know that you can give them just in terms of UN, right? They will belong to UN. You can choose a, a basis so that the, these, these things are represented by a, an element of UN. And well, this, they won't have this part or this part will be E to the power zero, right? And then, well, you will get the trace of zero of the matrix zero. Um, okay, so actually here in this slide, I was just doing the local computation for the first characteristic class. And I think already with, with uh, Rui's question, where I already explained a little bit, what you do is, okay, so you have to produce a map from G to R. So you take uh, an element G, mm -hmm. what you do is, Okay, you look at the, at the isomorphism that goes from A, E to the source to E to the target, right? You write down this isomorphism in terms of the matrix, because it's local, you can give it in terms of a matrix. And then what happens is that this characteristic class only, what, what it does is that it gives you the trace of the uh, Hermitian part. And actually, for the, from the local model, you actually see that if you do the Vanest, you recover the first characteristic class of Marius or Rui. And actually, this also gives you a little bit the 
the explanation why in their formula or in the formula of Marius, actually he was considering this sum, right? Because, I mean, you write omega as the, as uh, this is the Hermitian part and this is the anti-Hermitian part, right? If you look at the global counterpart, this is, <clears throat> this only takes care of the Hermitian part. So you expect that in the infinitesimal counterpart, it's only also only seeing the Hermitian part. And okay, so I finished just with some questions. Well, questions first, we have to look at <laughs> representation uh, characteristic classes for representations of homotopy. Why? Well, one of the reasons is because they will give you intrinsic classes for group voids, right? Because you can look at the a joint representation, which is only up to homotopy. And the second thing is that there should be some applications. Already in the algebraic case, there are applications, but well, you expect that here you will have the same and maybe uh, better ones. That's all. <laughs>